Um, yeah, it is my distinct pleasure to moderate our first panel today. And Mr. Kalber will soon be joined by uh, Peter Fleischer. He's uh, Google's global uh, privacy officer and Katharina Ludewig from uh, Coca-Cola. But before we start with our uh, three panelists, I would uh, very much like to uh, give Peter Fleischer the, the stage for, for a moment because he'll be um, elaborating further on one very important dimension of uh, international data transfers and the data protection framework as a whole because um, he'll be talking about privacy preserving technologies and that is also kind of a nice bridge to uh, what Mr. Kelber just uh, talked about because he already touched upon the issue of uh, data protection friendly yeah, processing and technologies. So Peter, it's very glad to have you with us uh, today and this year again, as always. So I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, it's an honor to join you yet again at Bitcom and an honor to follow Professor Kelba as well. Uh, I'm dialing in from my home, but let's uh, hope that this is the end of the tunnel of our pandemic work from home. And I'll be with you in Berlin next time. Uh, I, I wanna say a few words about three topics uh, today. I want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, ethical principles uh, in this space. I, I think we often get lost in laws and regulations and need to take a step back and think about what are the ethical principles that we're pursuing. I want to say a few words about ads because that's a big part of the global uh, economic ecosystem uh, in the digital world. And then finally come back to what's the topic of our panel's discussion, international transfers. Um, first, just a few words on uh, the ethical framework. Uh, you know, we, we published at Google something that we call the ethical principles that guide our work in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. But it's not just for those areas. Uh, and it's about privacy, but not just about privacy. And I think it's worth taking just a couple minutes uh, of our time together for me to review what we came up with at Google after long discussions, long conversations, to be these ethical principles that guide our work here. As I said before, you know, I've spent my entire career dealing with data protection laws and regulations, and it's easy to get lost uh, in the details and sometimes even the paperwork of laws and regulations. And if you don't take a step back and remember why you're doing this and don't take a step back and think about the ethical framework of why you're doing this, I, I think you just miss the bigger picture of what this is about. So instead of giving you the seven principles that we came up with, because I think they're really quite interesting, they're guiding what we're doing, and maybe they'll be guiding what other people do as well. The first is that our work in this area, AI, machine learning, and everything we're doing in this space should benefit society. The phrase is benefit society. It, it's not just benefit the data controller. It actually should benefit society more broadly. The second is that it should take care to, to avoid creating or reinforcing bias. Well, bias, as we know, is is embedded in big data. Bias is the problem that machine learning, AI, and other things can reinforce just because they look at patterns that have been pre-established. And if those pre-established patterns demonstrated bias, gender, race, sexual orientation, age, whatever it might be, they can reproduce it uh, unintentionally. We need to think hard about how to prevent that from happening. Uh, the third is that these systems need to be tested for safety. Safety is a provision of data protection that we're all well familiar with, but goes beyond it. Uh, the fourth is they should be subject to human direction and control. And in the GDPR, we know about the provisions of automated decision-making and so on. Um, they should also uphold uh, the standards of what we call scientific excellence. Um, that might seem obvious to some people, but if you followed the political debates around COVID uh, in many countries around the world, you realize that a science-based conversation wasn't always the only way to talk about a scientific topic. Uh, we also believe in incorporating privacy principles, uh, privacy design principles into all of this work. And finally, it should not be used to cause or facilitate harm. Now, those are all high-level principles. They're meant to be high-level principles. They're the sorts of things that are subjective, of course, um, but I think they guide what we're trying to, to do in this space. Let me say a few words about ads. Well, as we all know, a lot of the explosion of free services to all of us, to users, the free explosion of creativity and economic value, 
has essentially been made possible by ads, an ads-based economic model for free services on the web. Now, Google has been in that model from the very beginning, from our foundation. I've been with the company for most of that journey. Uh, and it's really an amazing way to provide free services to people. But ads are nothing new. They've been around for centuries. And everyone knows that an ad is more likely to be valuable uh, if the person who sees it is interested in the ad. So the question in privacy terms has always been, how do you show an ad to someone that is relevant to that person, likely to be of interest to that person, while protecting the privacy of the person involved? Let me cut straight to the chase about the debate as it stands right now um, with e privacy and other things. People are talking about the need to obtain consent uh, to the use of cookies to show people ads based on any kind of aggregation of data about that person or even about a pseudonym about that person. In other words, notice and consent. Well, notice and consent are very familiar concepts to us in the world of privacy. And the question is, what does that notice need to look like? And what does that consent need to look like? Well, the, that question might seem simple, but it is not a question in which there is a harmonized view across Europe. That is a, a question on which there are very diver, divergent views, even amongst uh, data protection authorities in Europe. And I think that's an area where we really do, as a, as a, as a society, need to come together and decide what the right answer is. Uh, some DPAs have taken the position that the more or less status quo is um, complies with e-privacy as it exists today. We'll see what things are in the future. Uh, notice the ability to understand what's going on, the ability to choose, uh, opt out, if you will, from um, ads. Uh, others have taken the position, Keneal in particular, uh, in its guidelines issued last year, that consent uh, needs to be as simple and on the same level as the ability to refuse consent uh, for cookies for non-essential purposes. But that's one country, that's the CNIL, and the CNIL is enforcing uh, its view of its guidelines uh, against uh, French and international companies at a fairly uh, active scale these days. So we need to see what the rules should be, uh, but they affect a lot of people. And suffice it to say, speaking as somebody who simply surfs the web a lot, not just as a privacy professional, I think the current model of being bombarded with cookie consents is um, frustrating for pretty much everybody. I think we can all do better than that, uh, whether it's about privacy or anything else. A few words now about, uh, before we turn to our panel, about international transfers. Well, this, this topic has been on the agenda for now many years. Right? Year after year, after year, we're talking about the legal issues of international transfers. And I think there are a few things in it that are broken, um, to be honest. I think one of the things that is broken is uh, something that comes out of a bilateral tradition of European data protection adequacy assessments, if you will. I think that model just doesn't scale for the new world anymore. The model where one country or region assesses a third country's laws and regulations and after years of discussion bestows or doesn't bestow a label of quote unquote adequacy on the third party. It's usually unilateral from one region to another. That just doesn't really work in a world of you know, 160 countries and international data flows and international data um, global infrastructure. So we need a, a better model than that. That being said, there's been progress, quite a bit of progress out of Europe. In, in the old days, and I say old days, even five years ago, the only countries that had adequacy were those that were copy paste versions of uh, GDPR or the directive. Um, now, with the adequacy that has been bestowed on Japan, we see an openness to understanding that data protection can be viewed through a lens of a country that has a different set of laws and cultures uh, than we have in Europe. The laws don't have to look just like the GDPR as long as data is protected appropriately. I think that's a good thing. The other thing that I thought was interesting out of the Japanese discussion was that it was bilateral, meaning both sides reciprocally decided that each other were reciprocal and it wasn't going to be a unilateral discussion from one country to another, but really both 
we're looking at each other's laws, regulations, and the reality of data protection. The third is it really was in the context of a trade discussion. Um, and I don't think that had happened before, at least not that I'm aware of, but the adequacy discussions with Japan were very much in the context of Europe, Japan, trade discussions. Moving to the United States, I think it's a, a fair question to say, could that same flexibility about a different kind of legal regime that was awarded to Japan also work in the European US discussion? Uh, could it also be part of, uh, of a trade negotiation? Some on the European side say, well, no, this is about fundamental human rights, but well, it, yes, it is. But at the same time, it was part of the trade discussions with Japan. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we are all working with the solutions that we have. Uh, as um, Professor Kaiba mentioned, you know, there are a new standard contractual clauses that I, mean, I think they took a year uh, to be made available. Um, but um, one thing I can announce today is that Google Cloud is now making these new standard contractual clauses available. So we are using um, the instruments that are available to try to make the best of a situation of some legal uncertainty. Um, no company likes to operate in a state of legal uncertainty. So, you know, hopefully we can all get to a space where we will have more legal certainty going forward. Um, that being said, we'll continue to use the technical, organizational and contractual mechanisms that are available to companies to try to solve this problem. At a certain level, it will require a political conversation as is currently underway. I've heard voices in the press and elsewhere that say that other unrelated tensions in the transatlantic relationship uh, may be used to try to torpedo uh, success in this space. But that's not what I'm seeing from the negotiators, I think, and I'm certainly not what I'm seeing from companies. We all know that coming up with a robust and legally certain regime for international data transfers is in everyone's interest. It's in the interest of users, it's in the interest of small and medium sized enterprises, it's in the interest of international companies. And on the web, essentially, we're all international. So, uh, Rebecca, I'll just stop there with those few little impulse kind of comments and look forward to our ongoing panel discussion. So, thank you.